Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day God has prepared for us once again here at Hayshire UCC. And it is wonderful to gather with you all this morning in worship. We welcome all of our folks who are here with us in our sanctuary. And all of our folks who are coming to us via Zoom this morning, video and phone. We're glad that you're here and worshiping with us together this morning. Our candles will be lit in just a moment as a reminder of Christ's presence among us. We remember that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with you. And this morning we do come together as the family and friends of Hayshire to gather in this space as one body of Christ. We come from all corners of our area to be here this morning. And whenever we do come together, we always hope that this is a time and a place to rest and to encounter God within our midst. So this week, a couple of announcements I want to share with you. Our trend here in the church building during the week is still a little bit quieter than usual, which is typical for late summer, especially August time frame. So we are... We only have a couple things going on that are on the calendar anyways. Uh, this Thursday is our last session of our summer yoga. And we are searching for an instructor that will um, be willing to share yoga lessons with us regularly for fall and winter. So if you know somebody who enjoys yoga and doesn't mind leading some sessions, we would appreciate if you would have them give us a call. So we are in the process of bringing it back for fall and winter. Also, just a reminder, our preschool is accepting registrations right now for the next school year that will start just after Labor Day for ages three through five. If you know anyone that has a child of that age, please encourage them to contact our office. We would love to have them come and learn more about our preschool. If you'll notice in the back of your bulletin, there's information about, and an email went out earlier this week um, Jenny Trostel's 90th birthday is August 21st, and Deb ha and family are inviting us to help her celebrate with a card shower. She knows nothing about this, Jenny, so this will be a nice surprise for her. She has been living with Deb and Larry for the last few years, so their address is listed in the back of the bulletin there in that announcement for your ease of access. So if you're able to, please drop her a birthday card and wish her well. I'm sure phone calls would be appreciated as well. I'm not sure if she's taking visitors right now, but you're welcome to call and check. So reach out and see how that's going. Also, you'll see on our top calendar portion that on the August 22nd, we're doing the first of what I hope are many Dementia Friends information sessions. Um, so we are starting our new ministry and outreach here and we are looking to share some information about dementia and alzheimer's what it is what it isn't and get some friends out there in our community as they say so hopefully you will be able to join us it is at six o'clock here in our sanctuary we're asking for um, registrations because you know we only want to have like 80 people or so in the sanctuary so we still have a little bit of space around us um, but we are planning additional ones in the future. So please call the church office if you would like to participate. Let Dawn or I know. We'll add you to the list. And so we're looking forward to having our folks from uh, Good News Consulting come and share the Dementia Friends info session with us. Also ask that you just keep an eye on the back of your bulletin. Check our bulletin boards and all of that as things are changing we're going to be having information out there as to what's going on or what's coming up so if you'll just keep an eye on that that would be helpful announcements joys concerns that you all have that you would like to share this morning miss sally
Excellent. So Sally says our garden is still growing beautifully. We have a ton of tomatoes out there that are ripening. She picked a huge basket yesterday. We have not harvested anything today yet. Um, tomato plants are so big and so full that they need to be staked out, and so we're working on getting that done. And we have two large cantaloupes, our first cantaloupes of the year, and I think that we've had in our garden at all, um, that are just about coming ripe. And she said once they hit the table, it's going to be first come, first serve. So but can fresh cantaloupe from the garden. Nice. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sally. Appreciate it. Other announcements, joys, or concerns? Anointments, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some... Ethan, do we have anybody from home? White. At this point, if there's Not anyone possible. at home that has any announcements, please unmute yourselves. It does not appear so, Brenda. Okay, thank you, Ethan. So no announcements from folks at home, but I do have one that I'd like to add to our prayer list. Some of you have heard this information through Facebook, some of you have not. About nine days ago, uh, Leah Parson had to go to the hospital. Um, she was getting out of work and she sneezed. I know that sounds funny, you go to the hospital because you sneeze. But this was not a usual sneeze, it was one of the heavier ones. And something was different about it. She said she was starting to not feel well afterwards and told her parents, I'm just not feeling right, I think we need to go. So they took her to the hospital and sure enough, she was diagnosed as having a blood clot in her brain. So it is treatable with medication. She came home last Sunday and she is resting at home. Right now, as a side effect of this blood clot, she's experiencing debilitating migraines. And so she spends a lot of time in bed or on the sofa or something just resting. So we ask that you lift up healing prayers for Leah and uh, also for Stan and Wendy as they go through this process with her. Um, it's a scary time and things could have gone a different way if they had not made it to the hospital. But we're grateful that God's hand was on her and made it be what it was so that it was treatable and that Leah is going to be fine um, as she continues to heal. It's going to take her some time to get past this, but she will be fine. So thank you for keeping that family in your hearts and prayers for the weeks to come. Also, um, it was brought to my attention last week that uh, a few of you have noticed that a friend of mine who occasionally comes in and does pulpit fill for me um, has been sitting in our pew. And yes, so Pastor Kathy and her husband Hill have been joining us, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, they have a home church over in Lancaster, and they really like our church too. So they're going to share their time with their church in Lancaster and here with us. Um, so you're going to see them, and they are regulars now. Uh, so Kathy will be joining me with some things in the future. She will be helping me brainstorm stuff as I go along, and y'all don't know how grateful I am. She and I did this years ago together, and I love working with her. So I'm looking forward to doing some brainstorming with her and seeing what I can come up with for our seasons to come. So we welcome Kathy and Hill as regulars, and anyone else who is now joining us, we welcome all of our guests that are here as well. We don't like to call out guests, so we're not going to point any fingers, name any names, or ask anybody to stand up. But know that you are welcome in God's house and in our house. We are grateful that you are here. So friends, as we enter into this time of worship together, remember that no matter who you are, where you've come from in the past week, or where you're headed in the week to come, for the next 50 minutes that you are home, let us prepare our hearts and souls for worship this morning.
Will all those who are able please rise and join me in the call to worship? Our hearts are ready, O Lord, our hearts are ready. We will sing and make melody, we will awaken the dawn. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. We will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great and endures for us forever. God's words assure us, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, God, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory Amen. In Christ and through Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. Well, if our kids or our young at heart come up and join us. seen you in a few weeks you were at the beach oh my a whole week boy wish i had known i'm going to come and visit you at the beach well that was very nice your brothers and sisters were there 
So, question for you, Ms. Leilani. When you are around family, or even your friends, do you ever do anything, or does somebody ever do anything that hurts somebody's feelings? No. no. I want to join that family. Yeah, really? <laughs> Nobody ever says something mean that they shouldn't? Oh, I'm re boy, you're really lucky. How about at school? Does that ever happen at school, somebody gets mean? Yeah, it does happen at school sometimes. It happens at work. Does, um, does a person who does something that they knew that they shouldn't have, that kind of was mean, say, I'm sorry? Do they ever say, I'm sorry? Well, Emily and Raylan don't. Emily and Raylan don't? Hmm. Do you think they should? Yeah. Why do you think they should say, I'm sorry? Why is that important? Because it's nice. Because it's nice. Absolutely. It is really nice to say, I'm sorry. So, when somebody says, I'm sorry, how do you feel? Feel good. Okay, thumbs up, she says. Feel really good when somebody at least says, I'm sorry, after they've hurt your feelings, right? Yeah. Today I was going to wear a dress with the top, but mm -hmm. uh, it was hanging down, so I decided to wear the dress in my RV. You know, that's a really snappy outfit. I love all the glitter on that dress. And also, yesterday I hurt myself. You hurt yourself yesterday? Oh my goodness. Boy, you got a nice little boo-boo, don't you? So what what happened after you hurt yourself? Who took care of you? Papa. Papa? Yeah? What did he do? He, he ran me into the house. I was watering my Nana's flowers. You were watering the flowers when this happened? Yeah. Boy, that can be a very dangerous pastime, watering flowers. Well, I was on bricks and I fell off the bricks. Then my then my face hit the floor. Ouch! You fell off the bricks and your face hit the floor. Yep. Oh. On cement. On cement. Boy, I'm glad that your face doesn't have a boo boo. I was say her face hit the floor, but yet her elbow is broken up. Well, her elbow must have taken the brunt of it. Save the face. That's a good this thing. And also my pinky. And your pinky. Yeah. Oh goodness. Yep. Well, I'm so glad that you're not hurt worse than that. Yeah, that was one of my worstest, worstest ones. Yeah, that was one of your worst ones. Oh my. Well, today we're going to be talking here in church about the needs to say I'm sorry and to, for and to forgive. To let people know that we appreciate it when they say I'm sorry and that how important that really is. So thank you for helping us talk about that and that when you hear somebody say that they're sorry for hurting your feelings that you feel better that's good to know so let's do a quick prayer this morning okay can we do that all right god thank you for family and for friends for the love that you show us in them and through them thank you for the care that we get for people who bandage our boo-boos who pick us up when we are hurt and who share their love with us. Help us to be as loving. Help us to say I'm sorry when we hurt others. And help us to feel better when somebody says they're sorry for hurting us. God, we ask your blessing upon Leilani and her grandma and papa and everybody else in her family and for each of us as we learn and grow with her and with them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing with us today. Bye. See you soon. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Prepare our hearts, O God, to hear your word and obey your will. Amen. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Hear these words. When he was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. 
and do not bring us to the time of trial. Pray this, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to, this time, to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. So today we're focusing on a new petition. This is our third week, and so this week we are focusing on give us this day our daily bread. The next petition in the Lord's Prayer from what we've been going through at this point. So this prayer has us asking God to provide what we need for our daily survival. Notice that Jesus has continued to use this plural language of our, our daily bread, as a reminder that we never pray alone. And we never pray for just what we need as an individual, but what the world needs collectively. So as we sit here this morning, it's important to recognize that even in these harder economic times, each of us has food in our homes for more than one, week, one meal or for one day. We have the option of choosing what we eat at every meal. And if we don't like what we have at home, we can always order something out or go to the store and get something different. This is not the case for everyone. For those whose cupboards and refrigerators are bare, this prayer is for literal bread. Something to fill the empty place in their stomachs and fuel their bodies for another day. So we pray this petition for them. And as we pray for these individuals who have the most basic of needs, food, how do we anticipate or expect that God will answer this prayer? Adam Hamilton reminds us that God's primary way of answering prayers is through people. People who pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and recognize that prayer as a call to action. Those who have more than enough become the answer to the prayers of those who are lacking. We become the angels, the miracle workers, and the source of manna from God, he observes. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, God tells the Israelites, Give generously to needy persons. Lord, your God... Don't resent giving to them because it is the very thing that will lead to the Lord your God's blessing of you and in all you do and work at. Hamilton reminds us that the call to give generously is not presented as a suggestion. It is actually a commandment. Hayshire is really generous in answering this prayer for literal bread. We faithfully have supported the Northeastern Food Pantry for years, and we still want to do so, even though they do not have an immediate need. So we have also continued to support Mr. Sandy's Homeless Veteran Center, and pre-COVID, we helped make available backpack meals for kids at Hayshire Elementary to supplement their weekend food supply. With Jesus, we know that there is always more to what he says, and that bread is not to be taken literally all the time. So, if one doesn't need literal bread, then what does this petition mean? What is the subtext we're supposed to understand? Hamilton tells us that if you look at the Greek word for daily, we will find the key to our understanding. It says the Greek word used in this petition is epiosion. And interestingly enough, this word does not appear anywhere in the Greek language up to this point. So Hamilton says epiosion doesn't even literally translate to mean daily. Then why is it used? 
So, what does it really mean if it doesn't mean daily? Well, let's find out. So Hamilton breaks it down. The beginning part of the word, epi, means on, in, upon, or to. And usius means essence, being, or substance. So when we combine these two pieces, epiosion would seem to mean that which is essential. The word daily doesn't fully capture the meaning of the Greek word, Hamilton states. So our daily bread might be better translated as the essential bread, or the bread we need to survive, or the bread of subsistence. So maybe this petition of the prayer should read, give us today the bread that we need to exist, Hamilton says. If this is a better translation, then what is this bread that we need to survive, to exist? What is essential to our daily lives? I mean, think about your day. What is essential to your daily life? I'd like to say chocolate, but I'm sorry, that's not really essential. Some would say coffee. That's not really essential either. To help us better understand, Hamilton references Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Remember that? Remember hearing about that at least? So Abraham Maslow first published the concept in 1943 as a theory of human motivation. Maslow's theory posits that humans are motivated first by our most basic physical needs of air, food, water, and sex. Our daily bread in a physical sense. Of course, there are higher needs as well that include in ascending order, safety and security, acceptance and love, self-esteem, including recognition and affirmation, and self-actualization or reaching our full potential. And of course, later in life, Hamilton tells us, Maslow would write of the desire for transcendence, living for a higher purpose, a life filled with meaning. While this theory was written 79 years ago, it still seems to hold true for humanity today. When we think about that list of needs or motivators, they still ring true. So it seems that the use of epiocyon points to the full range of things we need as humans to survive, not just literal bread or food. And scripture agrees. There are several references to bread being more than just food. A few of the more well-known ones are such as this. Remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he says, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We usually remember the first part, does not live by bread alone. Here it would seem that Jesus is pointing to something beyond the bread that is essential to him, something that sustains him and us, to have meaningful work caring for others. And our food is to do the will of our Father. So even more directly put, we can hear in John chapter 6, verse 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. We also remember Jesus telling the multitudes in John 6 that the true bread from heaven comes not from Moses. Remember that manna that fell from the sky? Comes not from Moses, but from God. The bread of God, that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then in a couple verses later, he declares, I am the bread of life. I am that which you need. We will hear these familiar words in the sacrament that we're going to share in shortly, Holy Communion or the Eucharist. There we reaffirm that the bread of life, Christ's body, is broken for us and given to sustain us, strengthen us, and nourish our souls. At the table and in the bread is where Christ has chosen to meet us, to remind us that he provides for all of our needs, And he is the only bread that we need to live and to live abundantly. Hamilton writes that when Jesus told us to pray for our epiosion, our essential bread, 
He was inviting the hungry to pray for physical bread. He was inviting those who have enough, us, to pray for those who don't and move to, be, and move to share. He was teaching us to ask for and to receive the bread that satisfies our soul. Jesus knew we could have all of the physical bread that we want and yet be spiritually starved. Jesus knew we needed something more. We needed God. Immediately following the word bread in our prayer, we find the word and, or at least we should. We see and hear it in our Luke and Matthew versions that Charlie read a few minutes ago of the prayer. Yet something, sometimes this word gets left out when we actually pray this petition. If you remember in your English class, we use conjunctions like and to connect two ideas or related pieces of information. So in our prayer, we have give us this day our daily bread, and it is linked with forgive us our sins or our debts as we have forgiven those who sin against us or our debtors. So this must mean that among other things, the daily bread we ask for is God's forgiveness and mercy, Hamilton observes. Forgiveness is part of the essential bread we need to survive. What makes forgiveness so essential to our lives? The sins, debts, and or trespasses we perform and carry in our lives weigh us down. They even have the ability to imprison our hearts and souls. We use them continually to punish ourselves, believe it or not, or others in our lives. Think about all of those sins and debts that we can't let go of, the hurts, the heartaches, as if you have a backpack filled with heavy rocks and you're carrying it around with you everywhere you go. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two more essential parts of Jesus' ministry. Remember, he came for the forgiveness of sins and to reconcile all of us to God, that we could have eternal life and live it abundantly. Without forgiveness, our world is left with vengeance and retribution. In our spiritual life, without forgiveness, we're left with a life of guilt and alienation from God. In fact, without forgiveness in our lives, no marriage can survive, no friendship can endure, and humanity is condemned to bitterness, resentment, anger, and hate, or at least apathy. In Jesus' prayer, this petition for forgiveness has two sides. We ask God to forgive all that we have done wrong to God and one another. And we ask God to help us forgive those who have hurt us. In this petition, we admit that we all need forgiveness and we must extend forgiveness. Once again, looking at the Greek word and its meaning may help us grasp this concept of forgiveness a bit better. The Greek word used here for to forgive or forgiveness is aphiemi, which means to let go, to release, or to send away. Forgiveness is a letting go, a releasing, a sending away, the resentment or the right to exact revenge. So if all the sins and debts and trespasses that we carry with us every day is a backpack filled with heavy rocks, then, then forgiveness is what? It's taking that off and letting it drop to the ground. It's a releasing, a letting go. When we pray this petition asking for God's forgiveness, we're asking God to release us from the guilt and the shame we feel Hamilton shares. Forgiveness is both a choice and a process. When we forgive others, we are choosing to let go of our right to vengeance or retribution, our right to hate the one who hurt, sinned, is indebted, trespassed against us, 
or the right to hold the grievance over their heads. And here's an important point. Forgiveness does not excuse the action of the one who wronged us. It does not say it's okay. It does not say that it, mat- that it doesn't matter. Forgiveness does not equal forgetting or wiping clean the slate as if it never happened. It does not mean that there are no consequences for actions. Reparation and restitution must still be made where the situation calls for it. Hamilton believes the fact that Jesus tells us we should ask for forgiveness reveals two things. One, we all sin and need forgiveness. And more importantly, that God is willing to forgive us. That God has forgiven us even before we ask for it. But the asking is important. Forgiveness is purely for ourselves. When we forgive others, that's a selfish thing. It doesn't sound it, but it is. It's a selfish thing. It's a process of our own letting go of the hurt that another has done to us. And that can take time and effort, sometimes years. It is a reclaiming of our own identity, our own power, our own humanity. It is a release from the prison of another's control over us, from their ability to keep us captive in their ideal of who we are and how we are to function in the world. Hamilton reminds us that in the Lord's Prayer and elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus linked God's forgiveness with our forgiveness of others. Why? Because we cannot fully accept God's forgiveness of the wrongs we have done when we continue to hold on to our anger and bitterness towards others. The key to forgiveness for ourselves, for anyone, is repentance. The showing of remorse and the turning of one's heart and soul toward God once again. Committing to doing our best not to repeat the acts of harm. Did you hear that? Once you repent, you don't go out and do it again. We're to try and do our best not to repeat the wrong we have done. Today's petition of the Lord's Prayer reminds us once again that we are never alone. That there are essentials that we need in order to thrive and live our best lives. The lives that God intended for us. And part of living that best life is sharing it with others. Sharing all that we have, physically and economically. And recognizing that we all have the ability to do harm to one another. And that repentance and forgiveness are as essential as healthy food, clean water, a safe place to live, clothes to cover our bodies, and productive work. All of these things are part of a right relationship with God, the most essential bread of all. So as we share in the Lord's Prayer once again, may we remember that we are in this world together and that we need one another to live it well. As God's beloved ones, we are to live in such a way that God's glory is made known through us, helping to restore the way that God created our world to be, our earth as it is in heaven. We do that by how we treat one another, how we care for our created world, and how we honor and celebrate our God. So as we join our voices together, may we hold in our hearts and minds that we are God's beloved, named, claimed, forgiven, and restored through the teachings, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, communion is up next. So if you'll pull out your communion insert, please.
Friends, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In the company of all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to this table to know the risen Christ and the sharing of this life-giving bread. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, loving Creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star, we thank You for Your constant love for all You have made. We thank You for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to Your will and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world, gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit. We offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God Most High. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, as sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were eating, On that night before Jesus was betrayed, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and then he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the meal, he took up the cup, he blessed it, and he offered it to them. And he said, this is the new covenant poured out for me, for you. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until he does so in paradise with us. Let us boldly say what we believe. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table, that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all whom Christ died. Amen. Give me a moment to get myself situated here. got my little tongs this morning. So friends, this table is Christ's table. This table is laid for us by the love and master of us all. We come to this table not because we, just because we can or because we must. We become because Christ invited us, because we long to have a deeper relationship with him. This meal is for all who come and seek him. It is for our youngest to the oldest here. It is for those who have come often and those who maybe have never come before or for who it's been a long time. It is for the faithful and especially for the doubter. This table is for each of us. Those who have sinned, those who continue to sin and have not yet gotten the courage to ask for forgiveness. This table is for us. May it feed us and sustain us. So friends, this is the feast of God for the people of God. We have juice only. We have regular bread, and I also have gluten-free crackers if you need them. 
So this is meant for you to participate freely. We have containers on either side. You can drop your cup in as you come forward. So my friends, the feast of God for the people of God. Come, it's ready for you. With thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. Let us present God with our tithings and our hearts.
Let us pray. Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving, we bring to you our time, talents, and treasures. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed. Amen. Well, it's just about that time again for us to depart for another week. The hour flies by. So friends, as we get ready to go, please share in this blessing with me. As God's own, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. We will do all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Amen. Please be seated.
Well, friends, as you go into this week, we always pause one last time before I send you out the door. And that is to remember that every time Jesus came into the presence, and especially every time he left, he gave each of us the life-giving gift of God's peace. So may the peace of Christ be with each of you. Go in peace, have a blessed week, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.